My name is Yufei. I am the graduate student coordinator at Grad Studies. And today's webinar is hosted by Andrew from International Student Services. And I will hand over the mic to Andrew. Okay. Welcome, everybody. And as Yufei mentioned, uh, today's topic is on off campus housing. Um, and so we're going to talk about a few different things. Um, the who, what, how much, and where. Uh, these are questions you should be asking yourself about housing. Uh, we're going to review a little bit about how to find accommodations. Uh, we're also going to talk a bit about leases as well as about safety. Um, before we get started, I did want to talk about maybe some common terms uh, that we use here in Canada for renting um, that maybe you're not familiar with. So the first one is utilities. Um, utilities are things like uh, electricity and gas that would be maybe included in your rent or maybe an additional expense that you need to pay. Um, now, I, I wrote on the screen here hydro, and so um, because in Ontario most of our electricity comes um, from hydroelectric, um, we, we actually just, you, we don't usually talk about electric bills, everyone just calls it a hydro bill. Um, and so your hydro bill will include water and electricity, uh, and then gas is typically what you would use um, for heating your house as well as um, maybe air conditioning. Um, a furnished or unfurnished apartment, if uh, the difference really is a furnished one, like you see on the screen here, you might um, have a, a desk, a table, a bed uh, included. An unfurnished room means that you would be required to bring everything yourself, or obviously you're not gonna fly here with a bed, but you'd be responsible to purchase a bed and a desk when you are here. Uh, if you see a posting that says it's for co-ed, uh, so that would mean um, any gender, so, so males or females, can um, live in the house. Uh, but sometimes you'll see postings that are requesting just male tenants or just female tenants. A sublet is when you are leasing from somebody else. So uh, somebody else signed a lease and then they maybe need to move or, or get out of that lease. And so then you could sublease or sublet uh, their room from that person. A landlord, uh, that is going to be the individual or the organization or company that owns the property. And then the tenant is um, you, the person who would be renting from that property. And then finally, a lease. This is sort of the written contract between a landlord and the tenant uh, that will outline more information about um, you know, the, the cost, the duration, and responsibilities of your um, arrangement for your accommodations. The question you want to ask yourself before you start uh, to look for housing. And so the first question is, who do I want to live with? Now, for some of you, and maybe a lot of you, um, you might not know anybody in Canada, you might be, um, arriving and um, maybe living with people that uh, you don't know. Um, and so if you're looking for a sort of shared accommodation, um, before you agree to live with somebody, you wanna have that conversation with the person just to make sure that you're going to be a good match. Um, you know, your roommate could turn into your best friend and it could be a great experience. But if you really don't connect and you have different habits, then, you can have a lot of conflict and can become a really, really stressful time um, because you, you want to make sure your, your house or your apartment is a place that you uh, feel comfortable living in. Um, so things like, you know, cleanliness, uh, do you both have the same level of cleanliness? Um, if, if somebody leaves dirty dishes in the sink, is, is that gonna make you really stressed out? Uh, what if you leave dirty dis dishes in the sink? Is that gonna stress out the other person? Um, do your schedules fit? Is, is one person up all night and the other person up during the day? Um, is one roommate going to be really social and want to have parties in the apartment all the time? Uh, are you more studious? So these are just sort of things that you want to think about uh, when you're deciding to live with other people. Uh, the next question is what type of housing do I want? And so um, around McMaster, there uh, it's a very residential area, and so there's different types of housing options. Probably the most popular one for students is uh, renting a room in a student house. 
And so the student houses around McMaster, um, very typical that they look like the one on the screen. And in these situations, you know, it might be five students, uh, might be three students, six students, depending on the size of the apartment, uh, of the house. Um, and you would all have your own individual bedroom, but then you would share um, like a common kitchen, share a bathroom, um, and maybe share a, sort of a living space. Um, in these houses, uh, bedrooms could be on, on the first floor, second floor, an upper level, uh, or even in the basement. And so it is quite common um, in Canada to have a, what we would call a finished basement, which means uh, you can actually live in the basement and, you know, it's heated and cooled. Um, there's probably going to be a bathroom down there um, and, and it would be suitable for you to live in. But just keep in mind that living in a basement, um, you're not necessarily going to have access to as many windows or, or daylight. Um, and living in a basement can also be a bit colder in the winter time. Um, it's also cooler in the summertime, so that's sort of a trade-off, but um, just some sort of some things to keep in mind. And so if you decide to live in a student house, uh, you'd be sharing it with other students. Um, most likely your bedroom is not going to be furnished, but there might be um, like your living space or your kitchen that might have like a kitchen table already included. Um, all of your appliances and things will, will be included no, no matter where you live. So you don't have to worry about getting a fridge or a stove or anything like that. Um, but typically the bedroom you're responsible for, the common areas are, are generally furnished when you move in. Uh, you'd be sharing a bathroom with others. And probably one of the reasons why this is so popular with students is this option. Um, and generally speaking, it is going to be the closest to campus because uh, McMaster campus really is surrounded by uh, a lot of these uh, family style homes. Um, the next option would be more of like a traditional style apartment. Um, and so with these traditional style apartments, it could be, um, you could be living with other students, but you might also be living with uh, families or, or individuals that are working. Um, so it's not necessarily gonna be dedicated just to students. Um, and so these could be single or double occupancy. Uh, so single could be a studio apartment, it could be a one bedroom apartment, um, or, or double occupancy, you know, could be, um, you know, a two bedroom apartment. Um, some are probably three bedroom apartments as well, but um, generally you're probably going to be looking for like a one bedroom or a two bedroom. Um, in this, you, you would have your private bathroom that uh, only you in, in the apartment, or if you're sharing, if it's a two bedroom, you're sharing it with someone else, you would have access to that bathroom. Uh, these styles of apartments are not going to be furnished. Uh, so that means everything from, you know, kitchen tables to couches to beds to desks, everything you would be responsible uh, for getting. Um, and then with a, an apartment, generally you're going to be signing uh, a 12 month lease. And so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about leases um, in a bit, but it's just important to know that um, generally when, when you first move to Canada and if you're looking for this style or a student house, um, the leases are generally going to be 12 months long. Uh, the next is kind of a hybrid between um, like a, a residence experience and living off campus. Um, so these would be uh, private, that they're not associated with, with McMaster, uh, but these would be apartment complexes that are dedicated just to students. And um, typically with these, they're going to be furnished, uh, so you don't have to worry about a bed or a desk uh, or sort of a kitchen table or anything like that. So they are move-in ready. Um, the downside of that is that sometimes it can cost a little bit more because you, you are paying um, for that convenience. Uh, utilities, they are going to be included. Uh, often internet's included as well as um, they, they might have TV for you. Um, they might have a roommate matching service. They might have some social activities uh, throughout the building. Uh, so again, it's kind of more like that uh, residence experience, but it is uh, like a privately owned building or, or complex that would be off campus. Uh, another option that, that some students um, 
do is, is living in a landlord's accommodation. Uh, so this is just how it sounds. You, you would have your own bedroom, uh, but then you would be sharing the house with um, the owner, a, a landlord, uh, or, or even a landlord's family. So with this, likely it's going to be furnished. Um, likely, you know, it might be a really nice kitchen because there's going to be a family uh, living there. Um, but you are going to be sharing this, the common space with, with the, the, the owners, uh, with the landlords. And so uh, this can be great to, to learn about a new culture and sort of experience a Canadian life. Uh, but the drawback to this is that sometimes you really have to adapt to what the rules are. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're a, a night person that maybe likes to listen to music, but they have a, a young child and, and you have to be quiet by 6 p.m. in the house, um, that there might be some conflict there. So um, it's really up to you. It would be up to the landlord, but this is another option that you could uh, explore. So the next question you want to ask yourself, um, probably the question everybody has, um, is how much can I afford? And so when you're starting to think about the cost, um, don't just think about the cost of rent. So the cost of rent is, is part of your, your monthly budget, but it shouldn't be you know, your, your total monthly budget because the biggest expense really that you're going to have, uh, ongoing expense, is going to be things like food, um, entertainment. Those, those types of things generally are ones that um, end up surprising people more because uh, rent is, is generally going to be fixed, right? You, you, you sign a lease, you, you know what you're going to be paying, um, but, but then it's all of these other expenses that tend to add up. Um, and, and when you're building your budget, I would suggest that you create a bit of a buffer uh, for an emergency fund. So, you know, some of you are PhD students and are going to be in Canada for quite a while. Um, maybe you've got a new laptop, maybe you're bringing an older laptop. What, what happens if it breaks? Uh, what happens if you, if you drop your cell phone on the ground and it, and it breaks? Um, it's good to have a little bit of an emergency fund available for these situations. So a, a quick sample of, of kind of like what a monthly budget might be. Um, that this data is from uh, the Moving to Canada website. So that's a really great website that will have, um, you know, general cost of living in various places, uh, including Hamilton, just so you can sort of compare. Um, so eating out once a week, um, you know, like maybe $60 groceries uh, could be a big expenditure. Again, depends on your eating habits. Um, utilities, that, again, this could be included or you might have to pay. Um, they can add up quite a bit, and with, with utilities, um, you know, keep in mind, if you are renting on your own, um, that's something that you have to absorb the total cost. You can't split that with anybody. But if you're in a, a student house and there's four or five people, then that's something that can be split amongst everybody. Uh, the same goes with internet. Um, you know, if, if you're living with others, that's a cost that you can split. Uh, the one that you can't split and the one that I think is most surprising to people is phone plans. So Canada has, I think, the most expensive phone plans in the world. Uh, it's not necessarily something we should be proud of, but it's just the, the, the fact that, that we have incredibly expensive phone plans. Um, and the part of phones that are the most expensive are usually your, your data. So, um, you know, I know in some countries you can get unlimited data for like, you know, $10, $12 a month. Uh, here, you know, if, if you want one gigabyte of data, you'd be looking at maybe $50 or $60 per month. If you're looking for eight gigabytes of data, maybe $100, $150 per month. Um, so the, the cost of data can really, really add up, and that can be quite a big surprise to newcomers here. Um, just, but just keep in mind, on campus, has really, really great Wi-Fi. Uh, in your house, you're gonna have Wi-Fi. Most restaurants and coffee shops also have Wi-Fi. So you might not need to have as much data as um, you, you have uh, right now. In terms of rental prices, um, so this sort of reflects uh, what I was talking about earlier. Student houses, you're looking at the cheaper end. Uh, 450 to 700 dollars per uh, person um, and that would be for that room uh, a one-bedroom apartment it's a really big range anywhere from 1200 to two thousand dollars a month uh, private residences is kind of like a 
in, in between. It's more expensive than a student house, a little less expensive than a one bedroom. Um, and then a room in a landlord's house, uh, you know, average price around $700. So some tips for saving money when, when you get here. Um, food, food costs can really surprise people and uh, eating out in Canada is quite expensive. So what I would encourage you to do is try to get in the habit of uh, you know, using your kitchen, find some favorite recipes some things that work for you, um, go grocery shopping and really try to um, make as much food at home as, as possible. You'll save so much money doing it that way. Um, and on, on campus, there, there's microwaves and places that you can you know, reheat your lunch. Um, so that, that's sort of our, our biggest money saving tip. Um, other things that you know, just generally you should do, uh, look for coupons, look to see what's on sale. Uh, a few apps that uh, we recommend uh, flip so that sort of compares prices um, and things like that um, to see where where is cheapest um, check out 51 that's a cashback program so sort of the more you buy uh, using that app and registering things you, you can get some money back uh, and then just be aware of discount days so so the grocery stores closest to campus uh, generally on Tuesdays offer a 10% discount to anyone with a McMaster student card um, and so you know if you're buying your groceries once a week 10% can really add up then the final question that you should be asking yourself is where do I want to live so um, most students live close to campus. Um, for, for one, it, it's really convenient. Um, and another, uh, a lot of students just generally like to be around other students because you know, you're close to your friends. Um, in, in sort of these more student areas, you know, there are um, you know, some, some restaurants that are catering to students, grocery stores, sort of everything you would kind of need. Um, in, in this area. And so um, the, the areas are called either Westdale or Ainsleywood. So w when you're looking for housing, those, those would be two areas to keep in mind, uh, Westdale or Ainsleywood. Uh, this, sorry for the bad Photoshop, but this is generally, um, you know, anywhere within here is a very, very close walking distance uh, to campus. Anywhere outside of here, you can still walk, but um, you know, you, you might just opt to take a bus. Uh, the, the nice thing about McMaster is that there, it's, it's sort of a, a transit hub, so there's lots and lots of buses um, coming from downtown to go to campus. And so if you do decide to live a little bit further from campus, which is totally fine, uh, we would recommend that you live close to a bus route. And so Main Street and King Street, uh, these, these are the main corridors to, to go sort of from downtown to McMaster. And so when you are looking uh, for a house, if you, if you find a, an address and an apartment that you maybe like, uh, just go on Google and you, know, you, you can select the uh, public transit option uh, and just see how long it's actually gonna take you to go from your house to campus. Uh, some students find like you know, a cheaper place um, without looking at where is it. And then they realize, well, I've got to take three buses and um, you know, it's going to take me 45 minutes or an hour just to get to campus. Uh, and that, that can be really um, hard you know, to, to motivate yourself to get up in the morning, especially in the winter, um, if, you know, if you have to stand outside waiting for lots of buses. So just make sure you know exactly um, where you live and how you can get to campus. So to start searching for places, uh, the best place to start would be our um, off-campus uh, website. Um, so it's our, our housing website. And so when you go to this, um, you can use, they, they have sort of a, a rental uh, search area uh, where landlords will post uh, various different um, uh, accommodations and houses for you to um, look at. And so what you need to do, you're going to use your Mac ID and password to log in. And then when you log in, you're going to see a whole bunch of areas, um, a whole bunch of houses or apartments um, that are catered to students. And so the one nice thing about using this website is um, 
it is just for students. And so most of these are going to be fairly close to campus, fairly accessible. Um, and the, the, the postings are going to be with a student in mind. So you can sort of decide, you know, because you might get hundreds of listings. And so if you're finding that a bit overwhelming, you know, you can adjust your budget, uh, how many bedrooms you're looking for, how long the lease, the distance to campus, all of those kind of things. Uh, once you've sort of figured out, um, you know, some options and, and maybe you click on a listing, it's going to give you a bit more option, uh, a bit more information about what is included. Uh, you know, is, is there laundry on site? Uh, does it have air conditioning? Uh, we'll show you some pictures to see if it's, um, you know, a nice looking house or something that's a bit more dated. Um, but also just, you know, keep in mind with pictures that, um, you want to make sure that the pictures look new. I mean, if the pictures look like they were uh, taken 15 years ago and it's really, really beautiful inside, um, it might not age as well. So just, just sort of keep that in mind. Um, you know, you could even maybe ask a landlord to send you a recent picture. The pictures that are uploaded look a little bit older dated. Uh, and then it will also sort of show you a map um, where um, where it is in proximity to campus. And again, it tells you what amenities would be included. Uh, the, another option would be the unofficial Facebook housing post board. Uh, so this group is not, um, it's not part of McMaster, but a lot of McMaster students use this. And so both landlords will post that they are looking for people. Um, but students sometimes post that they are looking for housing. So if you are, um, you know, a graduate female student, you only want to live with other female graduate students, um, you, you, can, you can post that and say, you know, hi, I'm new, I'm starting in September or starting in January or whatever, um, that this is what I'm looking for. And so people can reach out to you. Um, or if somebody posts um, an ad, then, then you can reach out to that person directly. Um, again, with this, uh, because it is, um, you know, kind of public, um, you're just going to want to, you know, make sure that uh, what, what's being posted, the, the price, what they're asking for, um, sort of seems fair. Uh, because again, any, anything that is, is too good to be true probably isn't true, and, and maybe they're trying to scam you or something like that. And then the last uh, suggestion to look for places is a website called Kijiji. Uh, I know that's kind of a funny sounding uh, name, but uh, in Canada, it's, it's a very popular website to use. Uh, so K-I-J-I-J-I. Um, and here, it's, it's a great place to find furniture and, and all sorts of things. It's really an online marketplace, just for rent. Uh, but you can certainly look for housing for rent on Kijiji. Now, the one drawback with using Kijiji is that it is um, open to anybody. It's not student focused. And so you can certainly find a place using Kijiji. Uh, but again, just go back and ask yourself those four questions because uh, the location, where is it, is going to be really important. Um, and you know, if you, if you find something, you can click on it, it'll give you some information. Uh, so for example, this one is, is obviously it's catered to students, very large student house. Uh, but also just be mindful that there are three universities or, or post-secondary institutions um, in Hamilton. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, it is close to McMaster campus and not close to Mohawk College or Redeemer University. You just want to make sure, um, just because it says a student house doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be close to Mac. Um, the other thing that sometimes students ask is about temporary housing. So, um, you know, what if you, you sign a lease starting January 1st, um, but you want to arrive in Canada early December? Um, where, where do you stay? What, what, if, what if you have family coming with you? Um, so there is temporary housing, you know, like Airbnbs, hotels, and hostels in the city, um, but there are not many. And so on sort of peak periods, which I would say like August, September, um, you know, December, January, sort of the start of term periods, there are a lot of students and their families that, that do arrive in Hamilton. 
and it can be sort of in short supply. So if you if you do need temporary housing or accommodations, just make sure that you are booking it well in advance. And uh, tourismhamilton.com, it's a great website and they will uh, list sort of all of the, the hotels uh, and, and options for you. So when you're searching, uh, it is really important just to, you know, be very um, aware that occasionally people do try to scam you. Um, and it, it's unfortunate that there are these people, but you know, I, I think in Canada, just like everywhere else in the world, there are some people that aren't um, as honest as, as we would hope. Um, and so some of these warning signs, you know, price is too good to be true. Maybe they're demanding like a really, really high security deposit or really high upfront costs. Uh, generally in Canada, you, you might need to pay uh, a security deposit, but it's usually the same as rent, uh, like one month's rent. Um, you don't need to pay like 5,000 or $10,000 upfront to hold uh, that apartment. If anyone's asking for that kind of money, it is probably not legitimate. Um, if, if for some reason the, the person that you're communicating with just can't show you the apartment, whether that's virtually walking you through it, um, or when you're here physically taking you inside to look at it, uh, that's probably a scam. So, so don't trust that. Um, you know, if, if the listing has lots of grammar mistakes, if, if it just looks kind of sloppy, um, if, if the pictures look like they're pictures from, you know, a celebrity house in California, it's probably not gonna be for students. Um, so, so just, you know, be mindful of, of sort of these warning signs. And then the other thing you want to make sure um, is how you pay. So you certainly can pay in cash if you want to, but it's not recommended for a couple of reasons. So, so the first is that there's no, there's no paper trail. So, I mean, unless, unless you pay cash and, and they write you a receipt at that time, um, there's no real proof that you have paid and, and that can be dangerous. Um, and then the other reason is you want to make sure you have receipts and you have this paper trail for when you file taxes. And so as a, as a student studying in Canada, you are going to be uh, paying taxes or, well, yeah, I, I mean, you, you do pay taxes just on everything you buy, but you'll be filing your taxes as a student. And, and generally as a student, because your income is low, uh, tax time is actually an opportunity for you to get some money back. Um, and so you do wanna, if you're living off campus, you do wanna have all of your receipts uh, that you've paid rent actually use the receipts towards uh, when you file taxes uh, to get some money back so so just keep that in mind um, you always want to ask for the seats okay so what is a lease so as a tenant you would be uh, covered under what's called the residential tenancies act uh, and so this is a, a law that uh, protects you as a tenant protects your rights protects your privacy uh, when you are uh, renting a place. Um, the one sort of um, uh, challenge with this is that if you are living in a, in a landlord's house or even the son of a landlord or, or some kind of relation to the person that, that owns the building, you would not be covered under the Residential Tenancy Act. Uh, so, so some examples of things that that act cover would be um, you know, if, if you have to get evicted or, um, you know, if, if, if you, you uh, don't want somebody like barging into your, your house all the time, the Residential Tenancy Act gives you that privacy. It gives you your rights to stay in that house um, and, and really be undisturbed. Um, However, if you're living in a landlord's house, um, the residence, Residential Tenancy Act doesn't apply to you. And so when you um, find a place, uh, typically, you know, um, you would ask for the lease. Uh, so the lease is going to be a legal document and this is a contract. So it's really important that you read it carefully before uh, signing. If you go to, the, to our housing website, there is a lot more details about, uh, about leases and I, I'm not gonna go over everything. Um, so I would suggest you go to that website. 
um, but it's going to cover things like uh, how much is rent? Is utilities included or not? Uh, do you as a tenant, do you have to shovel snow? Uh, do you have to cut the grass? What are your responsibilities on, um, on the house? It'll talk about um, deposits. Uh, it's very common in Canada for the security deposit to be the last month rent. And so um, people might say you need to pay first and last month's rent. Uh, and, and so what that means is if you sign a 12 month lease, um, you know, if you've lived there for 11 months, uh, you typically don't have to pay that 12 month um, because you've already used your security deposit for that. Uh, when you are giving a, a, uh, a deposit or a check, uh, you always want to make sure that they're post dated. So, you, you know, if, if you're paying, um, you know, like $600 uh, a month, you, you don't want to then go and write, you know, a, a check or, or, or deposit the full year amount. You want to be paying typically on the first of every month. Um, that is when rent is due. And then the other important thing about a lease is that you cannot terminate a lease early. There are always going to be some exceptions, uh, you know, if, if, if there's a safety concern or a health concern, but generally speaking, once you've committed to that 12 month lease or eight month lease, um, you, you are legally responsible to pay, um, you know, your monthly fee, uh, whether you live there or not. So, you know, don't sign a lease unless you're comfortable with it, unless you really understand what it is. Um, and you always want to make sure you get a copy of the lease too. So, so you should be signing it, uh, your landlord should be signing it, and they should be providing you with a signed copy. So there's two different types of leases. Uh, because as, you know, as grad students, I, I think probably most of you are out of country right now. Um, and so you're probably looking at signing what we would call a single lease. Uh, so a single lease is it's just it would just be your name on the document and the landlord, um, and really that that protects you because basically it says all you're responsible for is paying um, like the five hundred dollars a month for your your room. Whereas a group lease, uh, especially in a student house, it's often uh, multiple people are listed and multiple people sign it. And you're not necessarily renting, but you'd be renting the house as a whole. And so what that means, you know, if you sign a group lease, um, but two or three people just disappear, but you're still living there, uh, you would still be responsible for paying their share of rent. Um, so again, single leases are probably the, the safer. It's going to give you a bit more, um, you know, liability that, that you're going to be responsible just for you and, and not for others. And then for safety, Hamilton's a very safe place, especially the areas around campus. But you know, just general uh, good practice is to always lock your doors, uh, lock windows if, if you're you know, not going to be home. Uh, you generally never want to let anyone in your house that you do not know. Even if they identify themselves as they're, you know, they're here to repair something or they need to check on your furnace, uh, unless you've, um, you know, talk to your landlord and are expecting it, you shouldn't be letting anybody into your house. Um, smoke alarms, especially for student homes, is something that you will want to check. Um, and so a smoke alarm, as you can see sort of on this picture here, they're generally um, either in the bedroom or in the hallway just outside of the bedroom. And um, you can test them very easily, but there's just a little button that you push and it'll, it'll make a noise if it's working. Um, but you wanna make sure that wherever you're living that you have working smoke alarms, uh, as well as carbon monoxide detectors. And so because most houses use uh, natural gas to uh, heat it, um, like through, through our furnace, um, you always just wanna make sure that, um, you know, you have a carbon, mon carbon monoxide detector um, just, you know, in case there's a leak. I mean, the chances of you ever having to use a smoke alarm or carbon monoxide detector are so slim, but you wanna make sure that you are um, following those safety precautions. Um, some houses or buildings might be a bit dated and they, the wiring might not be 
um, you know, suitable for you to plug in a TV and a laptop and your iPad and your phone charger and I don't know, a mini fridge and, and all sorts of things into one outlet. Um, so, you know, you don't want to be overloading um, the system because uh, that's not what they're designed for. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you have any questions like that, you could always talk to your landlord. Um, and the other thing, you know, just, just general safety when you're cooking, um, you know, if you're, if you're using lots of oil or grease, just always be nearby. Um, you know, you never want to put something in the oven and, and then just leave for a few hours and then come back. Uh, you just want to make sure that you are following, you know, just, just general safety precautions. Then the last thing about safety is, um, you know, just be aware of bed bugs and other pests, you know, like mice or ants or those kind of things. Um, so when you are searching, uh, probably more for like a, a traditional like apartment, um, because gen generally homes, you know, um, that they're fairly self-contained, like a student house, but in an apartment, um, you know, you want to make sure you're not moving into an apartment that has a history of bed bugs or anything like that. So you could always just Google, uh, you know, the address, um, you know, whatever, whatever the address is, uh, bed bugs, Hamilton, something like that. And, and you'll see if there's anything in the news, if, if there are bed bugs in that location. Okay, so once you have found your place and you've signed your lease, everything's good, you've made your deposit and you're ready to move in, uh, what you want to do is um, make a time to meet your landlord and to get the keys. And the reason why I would suggest to meet them in person is because you want to do a little walk around uh, in the house with your landlord. Uh, you know, if there is, um, you know, uh, some markings on the wall or damage to the floor or damage to a carpet. Um, you want to document that with your landlord before you move in, um, just so you don't get blamed for anything when you move out. Uh, and so really you're doing this to, to protect yourself of the landlord coming back and saying, oh yeah, no, that carpet was clean when you moved in, you need to pay to, to clean up this mess. Um, well, if you didn't make the mess and it was there already, you just want to make sure the landlord is aware of it. Um, as, as a tenant, you do have some responsibilities. So, um, you know, you want to ask uh, how and when do I, do I dispose of garbage, compost, and recycling? Uh, am I responsible for shoveling or is there going to be a service that comes to the house to do the shoveling? Um, you know, if you have any questions about how the appliances work, uh, maybe you, you've never used an electric stove, you've only used gas, maybe you've never used gas, you've only used electric, all, all of these sort of things, um, you want to ask your landlord before you move in. Uh, and then the other thing to keep in mind, um, so regardless whether it's furnished or unfurnished, uh, you will need to purchase or bring your own sheets, beddings, towels, and pillows, and those kind of things. So um, even if you know you're, you're moving into a place and it is furnished, uh, most likely you are going to be responsible for bringing your own bedding. So for more information, uh, please go to our housing website, um, just housing.mcmaster.ca. Um, you'll be able to see the, the rental listings, lots of great tips and resources, details about leases, and more information about budgeting. Um, so that sort of summarizes, you know, it's a very brief snapshot of, of looking for housing. Uh, we do encourage you to attend um, some of our other upcoming webinars if you haven't uh, attended um, them already. So our next one is on Monday about applying for your uh, study permit. We have uh, another one, just sort of general uh, information that you need to know as a graduate student. Uh, so that one is, I think, probably maybe the most important one for you to attend. Uh, so please mark July 15th in your calendar. Uh, and then what I think is the most fun one is the, the student panel Q&A, which is uh, and there'll be four or five uh, students on the screen and you just have the opportunity to sort of ask them anything um, about their experience as an international graduate student at McMaster. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, uh, for taking your time out of the day to join us. And um, we'll open it up to some questions. So Yufei, if, if you're there, if there are any questions, I'm happy to try to answer those. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So there are a few questions. Uh, let me just start from the beginning then. Um, 
what about is there a bed bug, bug registry that they have access to to check for history of bed bugs? Um, that's a good question. I don't know if there is a, do you know if there's a bed bug registry? Not that I'm aware of. No. Yeah, I'm not aware of anything specifically. Um, but, but if you do a quick Google search, um, it's, if, if there are uh, bed bugs, it'll, it'll come up that there will be um, reports of it. Yeah, I would just, I would search for the news or Google it, it would be my recommendation. Uh, part two of your question. So do you recommend renting before or after they arrive? And if after, can you recommend a temporary place to stay? Sure, yeah, it's a great question. And, and unfortunately, there, there's no, there, there's no correct answer. So some of this is going to depend on your own financial situation. Um, obviously, you know, if, if you come early and you don't have a place to stay and you're staying in a hotel for a couple of weeks, you know, that, that's a significant financial cost. Um, the main thing I can recommend is you just always want to make sure that what you are, what you are signing up for is, you know, 100% uh, like legitimate. Uh, it does not happen very often, but every once in a while, we do hear of students that, um, you know, just aren't doing their research, they're not communicating with their landlord, um, you know, e even things like if they have an address, um, you know, go just Google map that address, you know, m make sure it is a picture that's posted, does it match the building outside, um, that there's lots of things you can kind of do if, if you are not here, um, It's but it's really personal preference. So I, I don't want to say you, you should do it one way or the other. Um, I, th I think there are the advantage of doing it before you get here is that you have a place. Um, the, the advantage of doing it when you get here is that you can actually physically walk around it and, and see if that's the place you want. Um, so I, I, you know, just sort of do your research. If, if the landlord is really open, you've got good communication, uh, with that person, everything seems okay, um, then, you know, probably it, it's going to be fine to, to rent uh, before you arrive. Uh, another thing with, with sort of the, the larger apartment complexes that we have, so that's sort of the more traditional apartment style in Hamilton, um, and any of those companies or organizations, they're going to be legitimate. Um, so, you know, if, if you're looking, because I know a lot of grad students do like uh, sort of more private residents. Um, so, you know, if you are looking at one of the larger apartment complexes, um, yeah, I mean, you can just go to their website and, and they're going to be fine to rent ahead of time. Perfect, thank you. And the third part is about um, the 14 day quarantine. Before Andrew um, says anything, I just want to kind of bring your attention to the survey that was mentioned earlier in the webinar. So Grad Studies is working with our campus housing to come up with solutions for the 14 day quarantine. And by filling out that survey, you're letting the housing team know about the demand and the students that are coming in. So I would highly recommend for you to fill up that survey to guide their decision. Um, in the case if this 14 day quarantine opportunity may not be available, Andrew, do you have any recommendations? Um, I, I don't, my, my guess, um, just based on what happened in May, because we did have grad students starting in May, um, you know, we, we, are, we are totally aware that there are a lot of international students um, arriving from out of country. And, you know, I, I, McMaster's gonna do as much as they can to make sure that you have those, uh, you know, the appropriate arrangements if you need it. Um, you know, in Canada, it's not as, uh, it's more up to the individual to do the quarantine. I, I know from people that, that are, going home to other parts of the world. You know, the government sends you food and care packages and all sorts of that sort of thing. In Canada, it's not quite the same. Um, but I, I do know just based on what happened in May, like, you know, McMaster did provide um, a place for students to stay as well as food. When we get to making those decisions, um, you know, you shouldn't be too concerned because McMaster is going to, you know, you, you are you are our students and our, our priority is your, your safety and well-being. 
Thank you. And just to add that um, the survey does ask you if you're bringing a spouse or our children. So letting us know through, uh, because there's another question that's related. So letting us know that you'll be arriving with other people would be helpful for us, for the housing team to determine if uh, what kind of uh, for, uh, rooms are available. Let me just scroll through the questions. So I have another three-parter question. So the first one, um, so the student heard that the houses in Canada typically have five to six rooms with only one bathroom. So is this something typical only for student houses or are all houses in Canada like this? Huh. Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess, I guess the student houses are essentially family homes that don't have a family, they have students living in it. So um, yeah, I mean, it, there are families with four or five people that only have one ba bathroom uh, in the house. It's, it's not that uncommon. Um, so if you, know, you need to have your own private bathroom, uh, probably the only way to guarantee that would be to get your own like one bedroom or studio apartment. Thank you. And the next question is about the supply and demand. So the students are wondering, should they um, keep subletting for four months sublets three times a year, or would it be better to take a 12 month lease and take the pain away from worrying about um, finding housing or um, moving closer to their co-op? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And again, it, it's personal preference. So you know, if, if, if you like moving around and you don't want to commit, um, sure, go for it. Do, do a four month lease. Uh, you know, summertime that there's, there's always lots of people subleasing because a lot of students go home. Um, so there's, there's always lots of housing available then. Uh, but if you do not want the hassle of, of searching and, and checking out houses on top of all of your other stress, then, you know, the stability of a 12 month lease is really nice. Uh, I mean, keep, keep in mind, if, if you sign a 12 month lease and then you have to go on co-op, uh, you know, you could always try to sublease uh, or sublet your apartment. Um, but if, if you are doing that, you always want to make sure that that's something that you can do. So, so not every lease will allow you to sublease. Thank you. And the part three of this question, so they're looking at fall accommodations and they're wondering if all the good good um, opportunities would be taken in July and June. Like, would there be anything available during late, late August? Um, so this year, <laughs> this year, because uh, a lot of students um, have returned home and so that could be international response students returning to their home countries and it could be Canadian students who aren't from Hamilton returning home. Uh, I think in the fall there's going to be lots of you know subleases available um, but in a typical year um, a lot of students start searching in February to to get a lease for May so so the leases for students generally are either September 1st to August 31st, uh, but a lot are May 1st to April 30th. Um, and yeah, generally speaking, pe people do start looking early, um, that there probably is still going to be rooms available for you, but you know, is it gonna be the best room? Maybe not. Thank you. And I have two more lease related questions. So the first one is, can I lease, uh, can the can the lease last for two or three months only? Uh, yes, it could, but it is not. Um, so trying to find a short-term lease in Canada is really, really challenging. Uh, I, I don't know why. I mean, it's not, it's not just a student thing. Just generally in Canada, leases are typically 12 months. As a student, you might be able to find one that's eight months. Um, or you might be able to sublease for four. Um, if, you're, if you do find something that's two or three months, um, you know, the, the question that I would have is, you know, because so many people rent for 12, why, why are they willing to take someone for two or three? You know, it, it, is, it, is, it, is it a safe place? Is it, is it not a nice place? Are they having trouble finding someone for 12 months? Um, so if you are only here, because I know we, maybe we have some visiting 
grad students uh, joining us. Uh, and so if, if you are only in Canada for a short amount of time, um, you know, subleasing for four months, which is the length of a semester, is probably your best option. Thank you. Another lease related question. So do you have to present some kind of warranty or anything to sign a lease? Mm, I don't think so. Um, yeah, not, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I mean, you might have to give your like a security deposit uh, initially when, when you sign your lease um, and only your security deposit. Again, you're not paying for the full year in advance. Um, and it would just be like your, your personal information um, that, that would be written on the lease. That's it. And the other related question. So if, um, if I pay a post month rent before, so essentially should they pay for the uh, month deposit before traveling or is it better to delay paying it until after arriving? Um, so, you, so if you need to pay a deposit um, and, and you know you're comfortable being in that place and you need that deposit in order to secure the, the rent, then I, I think you would need to pay in advance. But you do not want to be in a position where you are paying your actual rent in advance. So um, it is common for, for people to give what we would call post-dated checks. So, you know, you might give your landlord 12 checks, but they would be dated September 1st, October 1st, November 1st, uh, which means that the landlord then cannot, cannot request that money from the bank until those days. So, so that is something that they might request, um, but you just want to make sure that the, the landlord does not have access to that money and, until the first of the month because um, it, it is your money until that time. Okay, um, and so the next question is, if um, they're getting a private apartment, does the landlord have the right to have copies of the keys? And in their country, they change the locks when they move in. Ah, that's an interesting question. I, I don't, um, I, I, I don't know 100%, but my guess is you cannot um, change the locks. Right. What, what do you think, Yufei? Yeah, so from my experience getting an apartment, you cannot change the locks for sure, but um, the landlord wouldn't have keys, but the apartment complex is superintendent or they would have a master key so yeah so the land if you're renting yeah if it's a private apartment like a business apartment in a large building then they don't have the keys but they do in a way because of the superintendent if it's in a house or in a room then to be honest i'm not sure but the the guidelines that Andrew mentioned during the presentation does apply that the landlord does have to give you notice before they enter your space. Yeah, so, so the Residential Tenancy Act says that uh, I think a landlord has to give a 24 hour notice before entering your, your space, your, your home, your apartment, uh, unless it's an emergency. So. Uh, you know, if, if there's a flood or, or something urgent that needs to be looked in, looked into, then the landlord could enter. Uh, if you are renting a, a like a, a student house, um, you know, one thing you could probably do, not necessarily changing the locks of the, the main door, like the, the front door to get into the house, but um, you could always look about, you know, putting a lock on your individual bedroom door. Uh, but again, you, you need to be careful with these things because uh, you, you are then altering the the building and and, and generally you know as a as a as a tenant you, you can't make like structural or, or major changes so it's always a conversation you, you could have with your landlord to see if that would be something appropriate thank you andrew so i have one last question before we kind of we will answer all the questions that are in the question and answer queue but we will just answer one more live and then we'll provide typed answers to the rest of the questions so last question and i think it's on a lot of students minds if their program get deferred or if they decide to come in january instead when should they start look for housing 
Yeah, so th this year is very, uh, it's very different. T typically, September is the big housing rush for, for students. Um, January is usually a very small intake. This year, obviously, things have changed. Um, I, I think it's good to, you know, during the fall, maybe not necessarily aggressively be looking, but, you know, if you're on the, the McMaster off-campus website, you know, you check it once a week or every few days, you'll be able to see, you know, are, are houses disappearing? Is there less available? Um, and, and I think because this year that there's so many unknowns, I, I don't want to give you a date or a time because, um, you know, it. let's say you, you start looking in October, but then in November, McMaster decides um, we're online in January. Um, you, you're in sort of a, a difficult area because you've committed to this landlord that you will pay, but maybe you can't even enter the country. Like, like so I, I think really until the, we have more clarification about what's happening in January, as well as what's happening with uh, the travel restrictions, I would really kind of hold off and until we've got confirmation um, for the, the, that you will be able to be here uh, in January. Great, thank you, Andrew. So everyone, thank you for coming. We will, Andrew and I will stay uh, for a little longer just to answer the rest of the questions in the questions and answer box. Um, but thank you for coming. And if you have not attended a study permit session yet, I will highly, highly recommend to attend the one that's coming up on June 29th on the Monday, and then the graduate school um, webinars as well. All right, so have a great rest of your day and have a happy weekend.